Thank you, brother. Boy, well, it's a different pulpit. I was going, there was a cross here last night that I put my handkerchief behind, and it's gone. Somebody stole the cross, but they stole the whole pulpit, and they raised it up for me. I appreciate that. And uh, I, though, I told them the other pulpit was the perfect height. I didn't have to wear my glasses to read. But uh, this is going to work as well. And it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. You know, Friday evenings that night where it's the end of the work week and, and folks are tired. You know, they've got plans for tomorrow and it's going to be hot this weekend. So I understand different folks are not able to be with us tonight. But I appreciate so much you being here. It really has been a good day. We enjoyed a great lunch with your pastor and his wife and and Clinton Rita, and then I said, you know, I've never been able to check off the box that I've been to Maine. I've been to all of the other New England states, but for some reason, I'd never been there, and I found out it was not that far away, so Chris and I made a dash. Now, we didn't break any laws or anything like that. Uh, we're driving someone else's car, and if he gets a phone call, I don't want it to be because I did something, but uh, we made a dash and just really crossed the bridge into Maine, and and uh, we turned off Google and just kept turning right, knowing that sooner or later we would hit water and found Kittering Point. And uh, what a beautiful place to stop. And got to spend about an hour in the state of Maine, checked that box, and came home. Although we haven't had lobster rolls. Somebody said you have to have lobster rolls if you're up in that area. We did see some fresh lobsters being brought in uh, to, the, to the, uh, the harbor there. But um, it was just a nice afternoon. And something we don't get to do ever, hardly, go to, especially go to Maine. And I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to do that. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about what Chris and I are doing in ministry, I, I shared with you God's calling on our life. You know, I'm 51, and she's somewhat less than that, And because uh, you're not allowed to give ladies ages, but uh, she's less than 51, and greater than, no, I'm not even going to go there, but, uh, you know, God has worked in our lives for as he does everyone's life. He works from even before you were born and designs a path for you. And we act as if it's uh, this choice and that choice, but when we think about God looking into our future and seeing exactly what we needed at different points of our life to make us who he needed us to be, and uh, I look back at so many opportunities that God gave us uh, when we first got married, we were already surrendered to go to the mission field. I had already surrendered to be a missionary pilot. Went back to my home church to begin flight lessons, not at the church, but in that town, my hometown. And the pastor said, I would like for you to start a new Sunday school class for young married couples, specifically to the U.S. military uh, that's here at Fort Campbell. And little did I know at that time that God would use that opportunity as I taught that Sunday school class, we saw it grow greater than 50, and as any military ministry, it ebbs and flows with the rotations and who's deployed and who's not. And we, saw, we built some great relationships with some young families. We were there with them through Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and then we went on to the mission field. And they, man, they got behind us and supported us, and it was such an exciting time in our life. And I had guys in my Sunday school class that were helicopter pilots in the Army, and of course I'm going through flight school, and we had a lot to talk about. We were raising our kids together, and it was just a wonderful season of our life. And then coming home from Venezuela and really having to reevaluate everything in our life because we just assumed we'd be there forever and uh, went there with that mentality and that heart. And then when we came back to the States, God opened the door for pastoral ministry and again, I ended up at my home church as the senior pastor, and we were able to see God rebirth that church, a church that had gone from 700 down to about 80. And then we saw it back in the upper 300s before we left, and, and God was just doing amazing things. Again, we were back in a place of ministering to the U.S. military. So when BIM, I called and said that um, they wanted me to come on as the military director, I was a little bit reluctant because I did not serve in the military, and there was a lot of reasons for that, primarily my eyesight at that time in life, but, you know, I just didn't think that God could use me in that capacity, and I began to talk to others who had served in, in, in various capacities and military pastors, and, and really I just realized and said, okay, God, if you're in this, then you're going you're gonna to help us overcome that. My heart is to minister to them, and I, often, and I do know that when the military see your heart and your heart is for them, 
uh, boy, a bond can be uh, a bond can happen between you and them, and and they just want to know that you love them and that you care about them, and that's what all of us want, really. So we started into this a year and a half ago uh, as the director. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, currently we have over 80 missionaries that are serving the U.S. military around the world. Now that's husband and wife, so there's over 40 couples that are serving around the world, and each one of them has a church, and as that church, they are the pastor of that church, but there's something unique about military ministry that many people don't think about. Uh, When we were in Venezuela, the idea is that the American will train the national to finally take the church, turn the church over to them, and then we as missionaries will continue to do the same again and again until the Lord uh, calls an end to that particular phase of our life. What military missionaries are not able to do is they're not raising national leadership. The missionary is actually the stable force of the church because everyone else is rotating in and out. Uh, If they're in a Marine Corps church at some of the places overseas, they may only have a person in their church for 6 to 12 months. If they're in the Air Force, generally it's three and a half years unless somebody uh, is able to stay for two terms and then they'll be there for seven years, which is unlikely. But what we found in the year and a half that we've been with BIMI is we have an aging group of missionaries that are needing to come home on a permanent basis because of medical reasons. Some of them have served into their mid-70s and they're no longer, the health-wise they're okay, but the insurance doesn't cover them after a certain age overseas and they have to come back to see their doctors. And So we're prayerfully considering and praying that God will provide more missionaries and, and, and also... We're praying that God will provide short-term missionaries that will be able to go and fill in the pulpits when these men come home for furlough because there's no nationals to take the church when they come home. So there's some unique aspects to military ministry. But since I was with you, the Lord put another burden on my heart as well, and that is one one of the great things that we've seen that has been a tremendous help to our military ministries is men who have been in the military and now they're working a contract job, whether it be uh, on base or off base, and oftentimes they love living overseas, but, you know, they're just like, well, do we do that anymore? And I'm asking them if they would prayerfully consider uh, doing a job transfer and going back overseas and being a stable force in a military church, teaching a Sunday school class, or being there to fill the pulpit in the absence of a pastor, and just asking them to live their lives over there. And we begin to see some, uh, some men and women say, hey, I think God could use us in that capacity. We love living in Europe. We love living in Asia. And to give them an opportunity to go back, the jobs are plentiful as contract workers on these bases. So we're asking different ones to consider that as well. So if someone says, well, I'm not really a pastor. I'm not called to preach. I say, well, are you saved, and do you want to serve the Lord? Then there's an opportunity for you, and we're seeing some folks uh, answer that call as well. Now, as far as Chris and I, our lives have been disrupted by the coronavirus just like yours. Uh, As soon as this thing goes away enough that we can travel internationally, we need to do that. Uh, honestly, I, I've been trying to f- forge ahead and, and continue to raise our personal support. God has us at about 66% now. I thank the Lord for that. Not everyone understands, well, you're not a church planner. No, but I'm working with 40 of them and trying to help them do more and, and open more churches. But not everyone sees it that way. And so it's, it's proven to be a little bit difficult, but God has always provided. And he, he's doing that again. So if you want to pray for specifically, Uh, Pray that in the next few months, as we're not able to travel internationally, that God would give us good meetings that would lead to support so that when we are able to travel internationally, I never have to think about the finances again. We're just able to go and do what God's called us to do. So pray for us. We're working with some missionaries that have surrendered to go into military missions that are finishing Bible college or perhaps they're finishing their military career. We have a couple of them right now that are about to retire this year. They want to come on as military missionaries. So we're working with them, helping them to prepare for the next step of life. Deputation missionaries, we're working with them as well. So if you just keep praying for us, pray that God would keep us safe and give us wisdom and discernment, uh, then we would certainly be grateful for that. Now, I had prepared a message to, to finish out the time after Brother Clint was done tonight. 
And so tonight, you're going to think I'm trying to watch Boston's baseball game because I have a shorter message that's here. Now, I'm like any Baptist preacher. I can make it take as long as I want it to take. But, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I, I want to focus tonight on this idea of refocusing our families. Now, oftentimes, and I heard this from some of the folks in my congregation that were, that were older, perhaps they were my parents' age, and I had a military church that was constantly revolving, and so I would take a few months of every year on Sunday evenings, and I would preach on family. Not only husband and wife relationships, but raising children, disciplining children, how to have a godly home, and I would do that on a regular basis because oftentimes there were new people that had never heard it before, and if they were newly saved, they certainly had never heard uh, Christian principles applied to the home. So tonight I want to kind of take a really a sample of several messages that I've preached before, and you say, well, there goes the short message right there. If we're getting a sampler, we know it's going to be a long one, but really I want us to take a few moments tonight and and consider some of the, the things that the Lord says to us. I'm going to start primarily with a husband and wife, and this scripture is not just applicable to someone who is having premarital counseling or someone that's dating, but it's applicable to someone who's been together for 50 years. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, my mom and dad were celebrating their 52nd wedding anniversary, and uh, they were telling me after one of those messages, man, I wish we had heard that when we were younger. And I said what any pastor would say. I said, well, it's not too late to start now. And my mom gave me one of those mom looks, like you're, you're stepping over your boundaries right now. And, and that's okay. They had a great relationship. But tonight I want to start in Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. You might think you know what verses we're going to, and eventually we will get to those verses. But in order to understand the context of the Scripture here tonight, I think we need to start earlier in the chapter so we know exactly what Paul is saying. So if you'll begin with me in verse number 1, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. How many of you understand when he's talking about being a follower of God and dear children and walking in love, it is pleasing to God when we do that. Now, I love what he goes into in this next section, uh, section of the chapter. He says in verse number 3, but fornication and all uncleanness and, and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that uh, whoremongers, uh, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of Christ, and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. And he keeps going on, and he's, he's talking about, well, in verse number 8, he says, For ye were, past tense, he uses this word, were, ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about the fellowship of the Spirit. He's talking about, let's let the past be the past and don't, don't continue in the things that you have done in the past, but let Christ work in you. Be, be profitable to God. Honor the Lord with your life. And in the context of these verses, we go into verse number 20. He says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then oftentimes when you say you're going to be in Ephesians 5 and talk about the marriage, uh, we fear that, oh no, he's going to verse number 22, and we read, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And we fear that, hey, he's going to really come down on the women hard. But let me tell you, that's not all that this chapter is about. This chapter is talking about we are believers, we are children of the King, we are followers of Christ. And I remind you, as we've been refocusing different areas of our life, even in the area of our life, in our family, in our husband and wife relationship, and even if you went into chapter number 6, the father and the children's relationship, and the mother and the children's relationship, we are examples of the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. How many of you believe that as a believer you should be a better neighbor to the folks that live next to you? Absolutely. How many of you would say as a believer you believe 
that we should be better husbands than a lost person is to his wife. How many would say amen to that? How many of you would say, I need to be a better wife because of my relationship to the Lord? Amen. We believe that. How many of you young people would say, as a teenager, I need to be a, a better teenager because of my relationship with the Lord? How many of you would say that tonight? Well, I, I, see, I say that Brother Clint is going to be a better teenager because of his relationship with the Lord. You know, it's a mental thing to, to be older, and, and now we understand, but that's okay. When I'm looking at these verses, I want us to look at three things, first of all. The first thing that I want us to notice is a word that, you know, people are scared of today, and that is the word of submission. But the word of submission is not just found in verse number 22. Uh, the word submission is also found in verse number 21. When we begin that relationship, husband and wife, and, the, and then that day we stand before the Lord and we make a vow before the Lord, and I do believe that this is not held in the same regard that it has been in the past, but I believe we make a vow to the Lord. The day I married Chris, almost 28 years ago, that vow that I made was not only to her father to take care of her and to love and to cherish her, but that vow was to her, but it was also to her heavenly father. He is the one that created her. He is the one that has redeemed her. When I made that vow to her, and let me tell you, I believe that young men need to understand that when they make that vow, they're saying to God, I will cherish her I will care for her as long as we both shall live. I will dedicate myself to making her better. Not changing her to make her better, but it, uh, being the husband that I am supposed to be. When I look at this particular verse and it says, uh, uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, I do believe that that is something that God expects of the wives to do for their husband. They are to submit to their husband as they submit to the Lord. But it's not like this. You know, I grew up in the South, and it's amazing that you would even have me to come here and to preach because I am from the South. But in the South, there's some guys that, that think, bless God, she needs to submit to me. It'd be a whole lot easier if he would read the rest of the chapter and find out how to love her the way that she needs to be loved, and they find out if they would actually love her the way that she needs to be loved and the way that God told him to love her, the submission wouldn't even be a problem. You know, when we think about submission to the Lord, it's easy to submit to the Lord because there's no doubt in my mind that God loves me unconditionally. But if that lady right there is convinced that I love her unconditionally, she'll say, you want to go to Maine today? Sure, let's go to Maine today. But the truth is, when I realize that the verse prior to the one her submitting to me is submitting yourselves one to another, I understand that I too am giving up some rights that I might have as a single man. I'm submitting those rights to her and I want her to be all that she wants to be, and I want our relationship to be one that is pleasing to God. So when we talk about this submission, it's not a submissive hold where you've got them in a headlock and you're going, tap out or I'm not going to let go. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, you should be, honey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? I don't know where you want to go to dinner tonight. Oh, I don't know where I want to go. Where would you like to go? Give me two choices. And you're like, time out. Somebody just make a decision. Amen. None of you have ever done that before, right? Yeah, right. Okay. You're not going to admit it in here, are you? But, you know, the truth is, it's submitting yourselves in so many different ways. It's, uh, it's men you recognizing when she's having a difficult day, and you seek to meet the need of the day. It's her recognizing that you may be going through a difficult time in your life, and she understands hey, maybe there's something that I can do that would lighten that load. So this, this idea of submission is, is one that I really think we fail to implement in our lives. How many of you would say sometimes it's difficult to practice this? The older that I get, and the more that my body demands attention, it seems like some of the things that I'm going to say tonight are a little more difficult. On the other side of that, because of some of the bodily difficulties, the, the pains and 
Sometimes you just don't have that mental aptitude that you have in the past, and you're like, where are my socks? Where are my keys? Now, you can remember what you did in 1962, but you can't remember where you put your keys last night. In those times, it's, all, it's, it's also a time to submit and to defer to one another. And it's a way to express love to one another that you've never had to do before because this is a new season of life. You know, one of the things that, I, that concerns me is when I see the deterioration of a, the relationship between husband and wife when their children are in the home, only to the, for the children to grow older and to leave the home and then the husband and wife are left with an empty shell of what once was a great marriage, and now there's nothing left. And, it's, and they look at each other and they go, we don't even love each other anymore. You know, I think that's a tragedy. I think it's important for young families, and I, I hope that there's some that are listening here tonight. I, I pray that there are young families that understand that when my kids left the home, I wanted my love for her to be stronger than it was when they were in the home. I say this to young military couples and young couples that will listen. I say, it's important for your children to see the love that you have for your spouse and the deferment that you give unto your spouse. That submissive spirit. They need to see that you both submit to the Lord together. And, and they need to grow up in that home because if they do not, they do not grow up in that home and see that example, then they're going to... You realize your kids are going to do what they learn in your own home? Unless God intervenes and gets a hold of their heart. But I wanted to be, I wanted my kids to say, man, there's no doubt that dad loves mom. Our daughter came and stayed with us six weeks during the, um, during the first part of the pandemic. And, and uh, she would stay with us. And she's the one that, she's still single. So, you know, she happens to catch me giving Chris a kiss or something like that. So she rolls her eyes and is like, oh, brother. One day she came into the room and she just barged into the room and she heard Chris giggle when she came in and she was like, no giggling. I'm like, if you don't want giggling, then you can just go back to your home. I still love your mom. We're on our second honeymoon. I'm not going to say we're glad that you're gone, but sometimes I'm glad you're gone. The idea is the longer we spend time together, the longer we spend time together, the sweeter the relationship should be. You know, when we get to the point where we're not follow, or finishing each other's sentences, I think, we haven't spent enough time together lately. You know, there's some times where she doesn't want to know what the end of my sentence is going to be. She's like, oh, I don't even want to get into your mind. But when we spend that time together, it's just, it's a closeness. You know, we want to be that close to the Lord that we know exactly what God is going to say about every area of our life. So we want that for our own marriages. Now, the young people that are in the room tonight, they're thinking, oh man, this is as bad as listening to giggling in the room between your parents. But I say to you, hang on. Don't settle for second best. You honor the Lord and you learn how to submit to one another. You're going to have one of the sweetest marriages you could ever imagine. And it's only going to be because both of you worked on it. Uh, verse number 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore his church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now he shifts gears. Not only are we to be submissive, but he gives the husbands an idea of how to love their wives. Now guys, when you were dating... In your mind and in your heart, you knew how to love your wife or your girlfriend. I mean, you might have been like happy days, l -l 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 love, you know, or I'm so, 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 so sorry, you know, Fonzie. But the idea is we learn to communicate is that deep set enjoyment of that person. How many of you remember when they, you had to write notes, you didn't text? You write that note. Anybody in here ever write that note, I really, 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 really like you? Anybody ever see one of those notes? You know, I saw them from some college kids. I really, I'm like, that is so junior high. 
But they would still say it. You know why? Because they knew, man, there's something special about this person. I feel a different way about this person, but I'm not ready to put that love sticker on it yet. But then when you did, and the guys, here's what happens though. We are the conquering species. When she finally, you finally say, I love you, and, and your deep bravado, and I love you, baby. And she says, oh, I love you too. And she says, I do. What happens? So many times, and I've seen this, I, I don't know your relationship, so I'm not picking on anybody in here, but I've been around men my entire life. Oftentimes, when she says, I do, the men forget all that they had done to win over her love and her affection. And we go back to the way men communicate love. Fist bump. Swat on the behind when they walk by. You know, just spending time together. Let's go fishing. They don't talk, they just spend time together. They're casting. Did you have a good day? Oh, it was a great day. What did you talk about? Nothing. You know, that's the way guys love and appreciate one another. God didn't make ladies that way as a whole. Maybe a very small percentage. But ladies, how many times do you like to hear that your husband loves you? Statistically, it's been studied. Statistically, women love to hear that at least 15 times a day. And every man goes, ugh. 15 times? How am I supposed to do that? Well, you have to get creative. Again, do you love her? Absolutely you love her. It's not important that you know that she loves you. It's important that she knows that you love her. So he said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, how many, men, under, honestly, men understand sacrificial love. Most men that are married, they would take a bullet for their wife. They would jump in front of a, a train to save her life or to save their children. They understand that. But I want you to understand there's even more to that. Christ didn't just die for the church. He still loves the church. He still maintains a relationship with the church. And one day he's going to pull us up to be with him for all of eternity. It's an ongoing thing that we need to understand. Now, look at verse number 27, or verse number 28. This is, I believe, key for the men to understand. And ladies, we'll be to you in just a moment. But it says, so ought men, this is after following Christ's example, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth, what's that next word? Himself. Now gentlemen, men know how to love their own bodies. What do I mean by that? It doesn't matter your age. You can walk by a mirror and go, oh yeah, I still got it. You say, you wouldn't dare. Well, they wouldn't tell you, but I'm telling you right now, they can still do that. I mean, they can still see that. Whew, okay. There's still some biceps there, and the teenage guys are going, oh my goodness, I can't believe he's saying this. But you wait till you get older, and there's not as much lean fiber to be seen in the mirror. But you walk by, and... and, and you see this in, in college, you probably saw it, you guys who were in the military, you saw it when you went into the, the restroom, the shower room, and guys are sitting there and they're flexing, they're trying to get their muscles to jump on, on command. You know, when you're older, you still walk by and go, I can still get them to jump. They're still there. They're covered in a layer that we don't want to talk about, but they're, they're still there. When I say that, I'm not saying that just trying to make you laugh. I want you to understand, men... As much as we love ourselves, we are to love our wives. Now I'll say this in a, I'll say this at an outdoorsman dinner. If uh, you're making purchase after purchase after purchase to meet your own desires, and you're not making purchases that your wife would be interested in, you're doing yourself a disservice. Boy, it gets quiet when you do that because all the men are going, uh, let me think through here. You know, I think I bought her a new rake last year for the garden. You know, I got her a new blender. I bought my knife, a wife a new vacuum a few years ago, and man, I thought I'd really scored. You know, because men, we like tools. You get me a new floor jack, and man, hey, but, hey you really love me, don't you? So I get her a new vacuum cleaner so she understands I love her. No, 
No, it's the things that she doesn't need. It's, it's understanding what the needs of your wife are and meeting those needs. How many of you ever heard of the five love languages? I think it's important that you, you can go on their website, the five love languages, I think, dot com, and take the test. And be honest in the test because it will tell you of those five love languages, what is your primary language? And, and I believe that you should share that with one another as husband and wife because when you're meeting needs in that particular area, that's when your wife feels most loved. That's when the husband feels most loved. But if you're working in an area that isn't really that important to her or it's not that important to him, you're really wasting time because you could put that same effort in another area and, man, it's like score, 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 score. I like the way one author puts it. When you get married or when you meet a person, it doesn't necessarily have to be the person you're dating, but when you meet someone, from the very first interaction that you have, you develop what he refers to as a bank account. And it's a love account, if you will. And like the first time I met Chris, I was walking into the college for the first time. She was a freshman. She saw me come in. She said hi to me, and I blew her off. And I created a negative balance in the brand new account that I had with Chris Bolton. 1988, in August or September, the first time I met her, it was like, sucked money out of a brand new account. I had a negative balance. I'm in the red. You know, when you meet someone, you immediately develop this account and you develop this balance. I do it with Pastor when I met him for the first time. I did it with Clint the first time. Man, he sucked all the money out of everybody's account the first time I met Clint. You know why? He made me travel all the way to Ciudad Bolivar without meeting me in the capital and explaining to me that there was two airports and we didn't speak any Spanish. So when I finally saw Clint, I was like, I don't even like you. Now, don't tell me you don't ever do this with anybody. But this is what you do. And, and what you find is, I eventually, I came out of the negative with Chris to the point where she was willing to say yes when I asked her to marry me. Now, here's the important thing. That account is still open. We've been married almost 28 years. You know what I've tried to do to the best of my ability with the Lord's help? Is to maintain not only a positive balance, but a growing balance. Now, guys, this is where some of you, your wheels are turning, and I'm going to jump ahead of you here. It's not so that you can have a major withdrawal later and do what you want to do, okay? It's to help her understand that there is nothing else in the world besides your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that is more important to you than her. And ladies, you do the same thing. Now, imagine a relationship where both people are doing all they can to please and show their love and adoration for the other spouse. Can you imagine what that relationship is like? Well, that takes you right back to that first verse that we talked about, submitting yourselves one to another. That's what it's talking about. Men, you are to love your wives even as you love your... Uh, love, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. Here's, here's verse number 29. I love it. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Well, that makes sense. You know, we might be mad at ourselves sometimes, but we're not going to look in the mirror and say, I hate you. No, we're going to do everything we can to better ourselves, to better our lives. And that's what we're to do with our relationship. Uh, city, uh, verse number 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. Again, this is our representation of the Lord Jesus Christ in our relationship between a husband and a wife. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, verse number 31, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I think it's important that uh, you establish your home without the outside influences of the in-laws. Now, I've preached this before, but five years ago I became an outlaw. I'm a father-in-law. I have a daughter-in-law. It's a different relationship. It's not like your kids where you can just say what you want to say. Hopefully she's not watching this tonight. I have a great daughter-in-law, and I thank the Lord for her. But let me tell you, it's just a little bit different. 
It's so important, and I told my kids this, when you get married, especially our son, probably the best thing that happened to him was when he and his brand new bride got in a car and drove to California to go to Bible college. They were there for two and a half years without any parental oversight. And you know what happened? They were forced, and and they did this willingly, so I'm not going to say they crammed them down their throat, but they were forced to learn how to love each other and live together and love the Lord and follow the Lord without those outside influences. And I think that's very important. And that's what he's talking about here in that particular verse. Verse number 33. And we're going to look at this, uh, this third thing. We've talked about the submission. We've talked about the husband loving the wife. But I want you to look at verse number 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. Again, he's kind of, men are kind of thick-headed, so he just keeps saying it over and over again. Maybe we'll get it by the third time. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know, I do believe, and ladies, you'll have to understand this. I saw a book in your pastor's office the other day. I hope you don't mind me mentioning it. Love and Respect uh, by Dr. Edgerich. Probably one of the best books I've ever read. I've taught through it several times in Spanish and in English. Probably one of the best books ever written as far as this particular subject and even the verses that we're looking at tonight. Now, I don't know if he's reading it to give it to you or if you've already covered it in church or whatever, but I'm preaching tonight, so I guess I'll just say what I want to say. Amen. This idea, ladies, I I think you really need to understand this. No matter how old your husband is, God has created in men the need to be admired when they do things well. You know, I think of it this way. You say, well, that sounds rather egotistical. It may be, but God made us that way. I'm not telling you you just got to deal with it. It's just a fact. And I want you to understand that when you learn to find the things your husband does well and you brag on him about it, he will go out of his way to do all things well. Unless he's convinced he can't please you. And I'll let my wife teach that lesson. But this reverence... Here's probably the best example I have of this. When I was in Bible college in Jacksonville, Florida, my senior year, I finished up in December, but in September of that year, I'd been working for FedEx um, package service, and I mean, it was a high, it was a stress job, it was a high intensity job, it was very physical, and I had the opportunity to go to work for this trucking company and work on the docks at night, and it was a significant pay raise over what I was making with FedEx. So I took the job, and I went in, and Rex was my immediate supervisor. Rex was a football player and a football coach. When he came out in that walrus mustache and that barrel chest, he'd come out on that dock that was 100 doors long. And I mean, it was, it was a long ways from one end to the other, and trailers lined up on both sides. And he had his team of about 10 dock workers, depending on the night, and we had a certain amount of work that was time sensitive, it had to be done and all the trucks had to be on the road by 10 o'clock in the evening and we didn't start until about 5 or 5.30. So as the trucks were coming in from the city, we had to unload those trucks, sort it, load it out to the trucks that were going to other cities and states and Rex would come out on the dock and it was amazing to me, when he'd come out on the dock, he'd be like, go boys, let's go, let's go, let's go. I mean, he sounded like a football coach, didn't he? That was kind of loud in the microphone, I'm sorry about that. But I wanted to get to the full effect. Some of you jumped up and started running for the door. Where are we going? Let's go, let's go, let's go. When I think about that, he would come by my area of work. And there was a guy next to me that played football for the University of Tennessee. And I mean, he was still a pretty, pretty stout fella. And he would come by our two doors and he'd be like, we were both named Brian, as a matter of fact. So he'd call us by our last name. He'd say, bag it, it looks like he's getting ahead of you over there. You need to pick up the pace. And it wasn't that I was working slow, but he was, he, he, would, he was just pressing me to give more and to do more. But then when he'd come by, he'd come by and he would see that I was doing a good, good job, Baggett. Man, you're doing a good job. You're giving a good effort tonight. I'm proud of you. And you know what I'd do? I'd... <laughs> chest would swell all up. I'd go back in that trailer and I'd tighten it up even more. I'd pick up something even heavier. The guy next door, I'd work a little bit harder than him. I'd say, come on! You say, well, that's kind of immature. But I want you to understand, he had tapped into something that he had learned, whether as a young man or as a football coach, 
he had learned that when he bragged on his workers, he got the most potential out of them. Now, ladies, I don't want you to go home and say, come on! Mow that yard! Give me another lap! Take some time off of it! No, I don't want you to say that. He's out there blowing the snow out of the yard. You're doing great, baby! No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, if it's been a while since you bragged on your husband, now, if he's here tonight and you go home and brag on him tonight, he's going, well, at least she was listening tonight, but she don't really mean it. I mean, find something that he's doing or he has been doing. You know something I learned as a parent? Parenting is hard. You know why? Because right when they finally learn how to wipe their face off at the proper time at the table, instead of bragging on them for finally getting that right, we start thinking about the other thing that they're still doing wrong. And oftentimes our kids, they say, I can't please dad. I can't please mom. And they live that defeated life. Let me tell you, you might see it in your kid's life, but you can see it in your spouse as well. If they think they can't do anything right, then they'll stop trying. But I'm telling you, when you bring this idea of reverence back in, when you bring in this idea, can you imagine your prayer? If when God did something amazing in your life, and you, instead of saying, oh, thank you, Lord, for doing that, you'd say, well, what about this? You didn't fix this. No, we wouldn't do that. You see the idea of the comparison that he's giving us here? He's doing it as Christ loves the church. He's giving that reverence. He's giving us that idea that supreme example is Christ in the church. Can you imagine? I'm glad the Lord's not up there going, finally, Brian got that right. Now what about these areas of your life? Aren't you glad he's not doing that? But you recognize the area that we're doing right. And let me tell you, when you start bragging on that one area, parents, what happens when you start bragging on your child for cleaning their room? <laughs> I'm going to make sure that it's done. Teenagers, you should try this. Clean your room and just see how mom brags on you a little bit. You say, how do you know my room's not clean? You're a teenager. Unless you're an exceptional one, there's probably things out of place in your room. Let me just say to you, wives, when you learn how to reverence your husband, when you learn how to admire your husband, you are screaming to him in his language, I love you. Now, if you just said, I love you, he'd be like, blah, 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 I love you too. But when you say, honey, I appreciate the way that you've taught our kids to work. I appreciate the fact that you've worked all of these years and you provided for our family. I appreciate the way you gas the car and you clean the car, the way that you mow the yard the certain way. I appreciate your kind spirit towards our neighbors. I appreciate the way that you work in the church. Let me tell you, it will change your relationship. And God will be honored. Now again, I come to you tonight and this is a refocused conference. I've preached longer than I have all week. I love preaching on the family. But the idea is, Chris and I have a great marriage, but I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived yet. Chris is not perfect. She hasn't arrived yet. Lord willing, we'll have 28 plus more years together. But you know what's going to happen in that 28 years? We're going to lose parents. We're going to have difficulties with grandchildren. We're going to enter into a season of life. If the Lord tarries, we're retirement and figuring out what to do in the next season of life. I don't ever plan to retire, but I won't be able to do what I'm doing today forever. I understand that. How will we handle those changes in life? How will we handle those seasons? I hope it's with the same grace that God has allowed us to show one another up until this point. I hope that I'm still loving her in the way that she needs to be loved so that when she kneels before her heavenly Father, she can say, Lord, Brian's doing a good job. He's loving me well. I hope that I'm still acting in a way and, con and conducting myself in a way that she can look to me with a heartfelt gratitude and say, honey, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate this about you. And I can say, honey, I love you and appreciate what you do and I appreciate who you are 
as an individual. But let me tell you, if we don't focus on that and refocus that on that in our lives, our relationships can become strained. They can become distant. My wife, this afternoon, we had our, a, a dentist appointment just a week and a half ago in Chattanooga before we made this trip up here. And um, we met uh, because our earlier appointment had been, had been changed because of me having COVID. We didn't meet with our regular hygienist. We met with a new one. It was a young lady. And I went first. I went in the morning. Chris went in the afternoon. And I met her and told her about what we do. And we kind of hit it off really well. Her and her husband, no children, been married 10 years, kind of outdoorsy. They love hiking and mountain climbing, several of the places they had been, we had seen in our life, although I had not done the hikes that they had done. But when Chris came in that afternoon, she immediately began to talk to her, and she was doing it in the third person. I have a friend that really needs marriage counseling, and are you guys available to do marriage counseling? Can I give them your name and your number? And, and my wife said, happy to talk to whoever it is and talk to them, be a blessing to them. And today, we got an email from her, the person actually me. She said, would you help me? She said, I don't think my husband would come. He's not ready. But can I come? Can I talk to you? You know what? You know what this world needs to see? They need to see strong relationships between husband and wives. And even in difficult times, they need to see that God is able to help you overcome. So tonight, I want to ask you as you refocus. Tonight, maybe you need to sit in your chair, husband and wife, side by side, and hold one another's hands and just have a quiet conversation between the two of you and talk to the Lord. Maybe, maybe as you hold hands, you're just silently praying and saying, Lord, when we leave tonight and we have the opportunity to talk, Lord, would you give us victory in this area? Would you help me to be a better husband? Lord, would you help me to be a better wife? I didn't even get into chapter number six, and I, so I just say, kids, do you need to be a better child? Do you need to be a better teenager? Do you need to be a better son? And if so... Allow the Lord to work in your heart and let tonight be that night that you refocus and become who God wants you to be in your relationships. Let's bow our heads. In.